Well, good morning. How are y'all? Good to see you guys. Y'all all look a little cozy out there today. It is good to see y'all. Right now, some of y'all are like, I'm glad we got the big boy chairs, right? Uh, that was a big debate, like which chairs, and we got the bigger ones, so at least you're not quite on your neighbor's lap. Um, it is good to see y'all, though, and be with you guys, and if you're a guest, we especially want to say uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my voice is terrible today, so I'm going to be chugging on the water. If I run out, just feel free to throw me another one, okay? Um, but if you are a guest, thank you so much for choosing to worship with us today. And like I, I think one of the other pastors said, feel free to stop by the back. We'd love to give you a gift bag uh, just, to, um, just to say thanks for being here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about directions. You know, um, how many of you, and we're going to kind of have an honest moment, okay? And I want everybody to honestly participate. If this is you, just own it, Okay. All right, here's the question I've got for you. It's not super personal, but it's probably going to cause a fight between you and your spouse, but it's okay. I've got a question for you. How many people in here are quick to ask for directions? <clears throat> How many of y'all are really good at asking for directions, okay? Some of y'all are pretty good at it, right? How many of y'all are terrible at asking for directions, asking for help, trying to get someone else to help you go? Okay, so that's about 30% of y'all do and don't. So I don't know what the other 70% do. Y'all didn't even know where you are right now, evidently. But anyway, but I think most of us, if we're honest, especially men, we're not really good at asking for directions, right? Uh, I, and I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, I think one of the number one reasons for that, and it certainly has been true in my life, um, I, I'm a little too proud to admit that I don't know where I'm at, especially when you're trying to impress your woman, right? Uh, Julie, when we were first married, I've shared this with y'all before, uh, you know, she had been in, in cities a lot more than I had. Um, I was still just a country bumpkin. It didn't mean I didn't travel some, but I never paid attention. And so uh, Julie had to kind of guide me. Well, Julie felt like she needed to take that to the extreme, right? And so she's telling me to turn in our own driveway. And when we got home, I'm like, look, I got it from here. And finally, we began to fight about it uh, because that's what you do when you're newlywed. Uh, you fight about the most ridiculous things. And, um, and, and so, but I found myself, I was so proud, I, I didn't want to ask. And, and so even if I knew she knew, I would sit there and almost pray my way to places because I didn't want to ask her, okay? And I can't tell you how many exits I passed that she just sat over there with that smug little look that they get. And, and she was loving it. And, and, and we, have, we have had so many scenic routes I can't even describe, mainly because I didn't want to ask. I didn't want her to know that I needed help. Uh, another reason, though, we might not ask for directions is if you've ever been so lost, you don't even know how to ask for directions. Like you're so far off where you need to be, you don't even really know how to ask for what you need. Uh, you, you're just down a pig trail of a road, and, and, and you're like, I don't even know what state I am in anymore. Um, when we went to church camp, this wasn't in my notes. I probably shouldn't share it. Uh, I don't want to scare any parents out there. But we had an interesting bus ride. Let me just say that. We were in this huge bus, and now Clint Barlow had the privilege of riding in the front seat and he wanted to switch because I was in the back seat. I was like, heck no. Because what we learned is our bus driver was a little directionally impaired. At one point, I'm not lying. I'm not making it up. Be my witness, Clint. We're in Nashville, Tennessee. And she looks up at us and says, where are we at? <laughs> now look. I'm going to shoot you straight. At that moment, I knew we had a major problem, okay? But here's the thing. I, th I thought it was ironic because out of like, what, we have 52 people on that bus. If there was one person that I expected to know, I don't even know if she knew the state now that I think about it. I expected it to be her. So I don't even think Miss Tammy could have asked for directions because she wasn't sure where she was to begin with. And Miss Tammy, if you're watching this online, I'm sorry. I love you. You're an amazing person. You just got lost, okay? Um, it was bad. It was confusing. Um, we'll probably edit that out in the take, okay? I just had that thought. Of, oh, my gosh, what if she watches this? I didn't think about it. Man, I'm glad we don't go live right there. People are like, y'all don't go live. Yeah, you know, it's really the Internet and the technical. No, it's because we don't know what I'm going to say sometimes. That's why we don't go live. Ashley has had to edit so many things. Like, oh, we can't say that, you know? I mean, if these people were here, they asked for it. Um, but sometimes we're just too lost. Uh, number three, sometimes 
We don't know we're lost, so we don't know to ask for directions, right? You're just driving, and you're lost as you can be, but you think you know where you're at, right? That's how a lot of us lived our teenage years, right there. Um, lost and didn't know it, just had no clue where we were. Sometimes we think we've got it figured out. We're like, we know we're lost, but I think I know how to get out of here. And sometimes we, we don't ask for directions because we have a history of getting bad ones, right? I mean, I've, I've done that before. When I finally humbled myself and asked somebody for directions, I found out they didn't know anything more than I did. And they give you bad directions. Have you ever, have you ever done that? I feel like, like, let's switch from driving for a minute. Have you ever done that with like an Ikea furniture or something like that? I don't know who writes the directions, but whoever it is has no clue what piece of furniture you're putting together. Have, have y'all ever, and so when I was growing up, my dad, and he's here today. I didn't tell him he was going to make the sermon, but he's going to. There was one thing my dad instilled in me, is that is whoever writes the directions has no clue what they're doing as far as putting something together. And, and I can't tell you how many engineers we had to discuss over um, a prayer meeting, let's say, um, while we're working on a car or something else, why in the world would you put this here? How many of y'all ever said that when you work on something, right? Like, it would have been so easy to just put this here. And so, so we're just, and so following directions just is hard sometimes because you get bad ones. I, I put a basketball goal up for my kids the other day. It took the entire day to assemble this thing. I just think that's a little ridiculous. For one thing, I don't know why we had to put it in 800 pieces, but for another, the instructions were backwards on pages. I'm like, why didn't we do that on page three, right? I mean, we've all been there. And when it comes to directions for driving or putting stuff together, it, bad directions can be inconvenient. They can be a little frustrating. But when it comes to directions for eternal things, we got to get it right. And today what I want to talk to you about for just a few minutes is something we're calling directions to heaven. And and not to, to be trite, but I mean, I really want us to talk about it in simplicity uh, about what it looks like to be right with a holy God. Uh, it's important. I mean, it's important that we know. I, th- I think when we start talking about today's lesson and we, we kind of look from today's text, I, won't, I think it's going to do one or two things. I think if you're, if, if, you're, if you're in here and you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you should be more confident when you walk out of this room. But if you're in here and, and you're not sure, I don't want you to be confident when you walk out of this room. I want you to have a relationship with Jesus because it's important. It's the most important thing that you'll ever do. Well, today in John chapter 14, we're going to hear it straight from Jesus' mouth, what is necessary to be right with a holy God. And if you know your Bible a little bit, in John chapter 14, Jesus has been teaching about the end of his life coming. He, he talks about the fact that he's about to go away. He talks about the fact that they're going to deny him. He, he's, he's alluding to things that are coming up at the end of his ministry. And the disciples are starting to get a little troubled. They really don't know what he's talking about. And they're not really sure just yet. And they're not going to understand all of this until later on. But they're really confused right now. And he uses the word in the first verse of 14 called, and he says, let, let not your heart be troubled. And that word means don't be stirred up too much. Don't have this tumultuous spirit within you. Jesus is saying, look, you need to not be so worried, and I'm going to explain to you why. And in this particular passage, he gives them the way that they can follow him into eternity. I think in a room like this, there's probably some people in here that are troubled. I really do. I'm not trying to be melodramatic. I think in this room, if we're all really honest, like we, might, we might be able to, to fool the person next door. We might be able to, to, to fool our neighbor. We might be able to fool our coworker. But when we get really quiet in the quietest part of our day and we just sit there and really contemplate eternity, if we're really honest, some of us are not quite sure and we're troubled. And so what do we do? We just avoid it. We don't think about it. We don't, we don't act like it matters. And we think we can put it off and push it off until another day. But I want to tell you today that you can have confidence that you are right with a holy God. That is possible. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus is trying to give them the way to follow him. Because they're saying, we don't know how to follow you. We don't know where you're going. We don't know what to do. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says these incredible words. It's one of the most simple passages but most profound passages in the New Testament. It says, Jesus answered, or Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So so the guys are going, we don't know how to get to the Father. You say you're going to the Father. You say you're headed out and you're going to prepare a place for us. 
but we don't know how to get there. I mean, we've been following you around on this earth. We've been going from village to village. We've been going and watching you do miracles. But now you're talking about going to another place, and we have no clue how to get there. And Jesus says, well, I want to tell you one thing. If you're going to get there, there's only one way, and it's going to be through me. He says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And that's what we're going to look at today for just a few minutes. These three truths that Jesus is trying to get across. And the first one is this, it's that Jesus is the way. When you look at this word in the original language, I'm not great at English, so I'm really not good at Greek, okay? But I'm going to take a stab at it. This word is translated hodos. H-O-D-O-S is how we would transliterate that word, hodos. And the word literally translates out to the word road. If you look in other parts of the scripture over and over and over again, you're going to see it translated way sometimes, but it oftentimes is going to be translated road. And Jesus is looking at the disciples and said, if you want to get to the destination of the Father, if you want to be right with God in eternity, I want you to know there's a road that gets you there. And I am that road. I am the road. I'm not a road. I'm not one of the roads. I'm not a, a pl- one, of, one of the possible ways you can get there. He says, I am the road. You know, roads are funny things sometimes because roads, what I've noticed about roads out here is they really just don't care about my intentions. I mean, when I get out on the road out here in, ju- in just a little bit and I hightail it out of here at Round Prairie at a reasonable pace so I don't get pulled over again, that's happened a few times. Um, anyway, but when I drive out of here, I can have the best of intentions of where I want to end up. But the only thing that's really going to determine where I end up is which road I get on. The road really doesn't care about my heart, right? The road doesn't really care about my intentions. The road is just a road. I, I, I don't know if this is, a, this is really not proper grammar, but I was just sitting there when I was preparing this sermon. I was like, roads don't really have any thought about your intention. Roads just road. That's what they do, right? They just rode around. That's all they do. And and that's the truth. And so no matter how well intended I am, if I'm not on the right road, I'm not going to get to where I need to be. There's only one road. Well, there's a few, but there's only, you know, there's certain roads that go certain places. And I can look at all these other options and I can think about how well intended it is. And I might wish I lived in that neighborhood, but my road is not over there. There's only this road that goes to my house. And Jesus is trying to tell them something that's really important because there's going to be a lot of people that talk about different ways to be right with God. And for 2,000 years, we have seen group after group and person after person share all their ideas ideas and opinions on how to be right with God. And Jesus said 2,000 years ago, it's not a mystery. If you're going to be right with the Father, I'm the road to get you there. You can't do it any other way. There's only one road. And we need to make sure that we understand that because roads don't really care about your intentions. Whichever road you're on determines your destinations. Roads don't really care about our opinions. You know, I mean, I, I really sometimes wish that my road was smoother. And so I, how silly, though, would it be for me to get on a road that they just topped in another part of the county and go, I wish I lived on this road. This road's going to be my new road to my house. Well, unless you buy property over there, that road's never going to get you there. It's just something, it's just wishful thinking. It doesn't matter what you think the road should do. It's what the road actually does do. And really, lastly, roads don't care much about my convenience. They just kind of lead where they lead, and I just have to take the curves as they come. And I know that's all, it sounds all kind of silly, but I wanna, I'm trying to set this up because when we are heading in the wrong direction on a road, you can't wish your way correct. You have to just get on the correct road. Y'all follow me? We we can wish all day long that this was our road. We can go, man, I think this should be the road to God. I think this should be the road to heaven. I, I think this sounds better. And Jesus is saying, you can think all that you want, but at the end of the day, there's only one road that leads to the Father, and that's Jesus Christ. That's the road. And there's a lot of people out there in our world, and there's probably some people in this room right now that are on some other roads trying to be right with a holy God. But I want to tell you what you're going to find is when you enter into eternity, those roads only lead to a place called hell. No matter how well intended, no matter how genuine, no matter how passionate, none of that really matters. What matters is the road you take. Some roads that we take today, 
One of the most popular is that if I can just work hard enough, God will grant me a place in heaven. Jesus didn't say that I'm a road and there's another one called work. He didn't say if you go to the temple enough, if you go to church enough, if you give enough money, if you, you, know, if you do this, if you do that, that's, that's a good road too. He doesn't mention any of those things. He says there's a way to the Father and that's through me. I'm the road. And, but a lot of us, we don't want to depend on works. Another way that a lot of us do is, is sometimes people go, well, God's a God of love, so I just depend on God being loving. Well, guess what? God is loving, but God is also just, and that's why Jesus came to begin with. Is because if God was just a God of love, Jesus would never have to die on the cross for our sins. But because God said that sin demands a payment, he made sure to provide that payment in Jesus Christ. You can't say God didn't make a way, but the way is not through your goodness or your holiness. It's going to only be through the work of Jesus Christ. You see, that's what's going on here. And we can be on different roads. Maybe God will overlook it. God's not going to overlook it. All sin will be atoned for. Every sin that has ever been committed is going to be paid for, either by the people who committed them in eternity in a place called hell, or it's going to be atoned for and paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. He gives you the choice to decide today, do you want to pay for it, or do you want to get him to pay for it? It's going to be paid for. God is going to. To, have, to be a just God, things are going to be atoned for. Sometimes we think if we just avoid the bad things, or maybe if I'm good, just outweighs my bad. These are all roads that people attempt to get to, Jesus, or to get to God. But the reality is, is you cannot have those things as true, and this word is true. They are contradictory. It's either this, or it's nothing else. It, it, and so Jesus says, I'm the road. And then he goes on and he says, I'm the truth. So, so see, Jesus isn't just the, the way. He says, I'm the truth. Now, this kind of looks out of, out of place here because you're like, well, how does this have to do with getting directions and, and eternity? How does this really factor in? Well, we'll see. Here's what I think Jesus is really trying to get across to these guys. Because when Jesus steps off the cross, or when Jesus comes, is, 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 is crucified and buried and rises to, from the dead, and then he ascends back to heaven, Jesus knows these guys are going to have the Spirit of God in them, but they're still going to have to uh, live life a whole different way. They don't have him to walk in front of them anymore. And he knows, just like today, that people are going to be professing other things as true. It's kind of like the road, right? Uh, this, this other road's good, that other road's good. And some of the teachings and some of the truths are some of the things people are going to try to convince you of. Uh, you're going to have to always remember that, that Jesus is the truth. It doesn't matter how eloquent the argument is. It doesn't matter how, how good it sounds. Jesus says nothing really changes. I am the truth. And I'm going to be honest, this is the point when I was preparing this sermon, I was like, God, I'm looking, but I mean, how does that really, why, why do I need to know that? I mean, why would any other teaching be appealing? And, th and then this is kind of where we're at, is the reason that other, quote, teaching would be appealing is because if Jesus is the truth, then that means I am broken without him. That means that I am hopeless on my own. That means I am helpless to save myself. Because those are the things that Jesus taught us. If Jesus is truth, then I am wicked on my own. I am an enemy to the cross of Christ on my own. And that's a truth that I don't like to hear much of. You see, we live in a culture where we always want to build people up. Right? I mean, we always make people feel good about themselves. And I'm not saying we go out and just tell people how bad they are. But it's like I've told y'all before. I told y'all this a few months ago. If you don't believe that we come broken by sin, you've never spent a night with a toddler. I'm telling you, you don't have to teach them little rascals to do bad. You have to correct them because they are bent on evil. They are. I'm telling you. That's why when I come to you, and I tell you that your child's an angel, you need to know something. I also know that Satan was an angel, right? <laughs> it may not be what you think. Man, what an angel. We talk about him all the time. 
Man, we just, oh, y'all pray over him. Well, we pray about him. There's no doubt, all right? And what a, what a little angel you got there. <laughs> Fallen, but he's an angel, right? <laughs> I'm telling you. See, see we are broken. And, and the sooner we realize that, the sooner we can be made right with the holy God. Because if we think we have it in us to reach him with our goodness, we are lying to ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Because he's the truth. And we are broken. And I have to admit that if Jesus is truth, I have to recognize some things about me are true. I'm broken. Another truth I have to realize that's hard is that following Jesus means that I stop following my own ambitions. Did you know that when we talk about salvation, we know that we don't work our way to heaven. We know that. But true gospel salvation will transform your life. Jesus changes everything, I'm telling you. And, and if your life looks no different and Jesus came in, you need to question whether or not you invited Jesus in or something else. Because Jesus changes things. doesn't mean we don't struggle some. doesn't mean we don't mess up, right? But Jesus changes things. And so when, when we, but if, I, if I have to go through Jesus, then I understand truths like, or a passage of Scripture that when Jesus was talking to his disciples and he says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Can I, can I be really honest? As Baptists, I think we've done a really poor job of preaching this part of the gospel. True salvation should result in true life change. True salvation should be accompanied by a turning away of the things of this world. True salvation should generate a passion for holiness. And I think it's more comfortable sometimes to go, well, it's not a big deal. I mean, you know, God, God can, God, God's love is enough, and let's just be real in here. Let, let's be real. We are broken, there's no doubt. But when we are redeemed, then we have now the Spirit of God dwelling in us to now battle against the brokenness that we have to live with in this flesh. Uh, but, but the truth of this is that I, I, following Jesus means that I stop following my own ambitions. There's new plans in my life, and I don't know if I want to hear that. I want to be at a church where maybe I just go on Sundays, check my job, my, check it off, and then I feel good about things, and I don't really have any difference in my life. Let me tell you, Jesus wants to change everything about us. Jesus changes the way you parent. Jesus changes the way that you're married. Jesus should change the way you handle your finances. Everything about your life should be inundated by the grace of God and transforming it all. But if we look at it and go, well, it's just a Sunday morning thing, we're missing the truth of the gospel. And the third thing that I think we struggle with is because if I follow Jesus, it means I've got to put away some sin in my life that I really like. I said it, right, I'm a pastor, but let me tell you, I will never be the pastor that tells you that sin is not enjoyable. If it was not enjoyable, we would not be commanded to not do it. There's a reason we're tempted to do it is because we want to. Like, God has to command that because naturally it's easy, right? It's, it's really easy to do those things. It's really comfortable. It's really fun. It's really pleasurable. But when we follow Jesus, it means we have to take inventory of our lives and there's this word called repent, which means we, we turn and we, we, we intentionally say, God, I want your life. And, and then we, we have this battle every day to put to death those things that challenge us. And guess what? Some days are better than others. Amen? Some of y'all had a rough morning. Some of you parents, right? Easy like Sunday morning. Who's saying that, right? It's, it's hard. But Jesus is truth, and so those things are true, and we need to understand that we can't alter reality to our liking and we can't subtract things that are unpleasant or add things that make us feel better. It's either all Jesus, the way Jesus presented himself, or it's no, no Jesus, because Jesus is the truth. Truth is in accordance to fact or reality. Jesus says, I'm, I'm reality. This is the truth, no matter if you like it or not. And when we water down the true Jesus, we're simply left with a good moral teacher who just wants you to give you a great life right now. And, and, and if your God 
is so consumed with just your life on this earth being beautiful and wonderful and easy, you have a false God. God does care. God loves. God gets involved in our lives. There's no doubt about it. And, and, and we can live a meaningful, substantial life now. But it's not always easy when you do it God's way. But when we water down the true Jesus, we miss him altogether. Because truth doesn't change just because culture changes. Truth doesn't change just because we're in a different generation. Truth is the same. And the same Jesus that was needed 2,000 years ago and the same Jesus that transformed hearts then is the same Jesus who transforms hearts now. The same Jesus that conquered sin and, and, and broke down strongholds back then is the same Jesus who breaks them today. I hear people sometimes talk about this world and go, oh my gosh, there's just no hope. Let me tell you, this world has always been broken and it's always been the work of God to break those strongholds. Our goal shouldn't be to constantly curse the darkness, but to throw some Jesus in the middle of it and watch him wreak havoc. That's the goal. Because Jesus is truth, and that didn't change just because culture changes. And when we see something we don't agree with or something that's uncomfortable in the Scriptures, we need to be like Francis Chan that said, when I see something in the Bible that I disagree with, I assume I'm wrong. But that's where you got to start. I'm going to tell you, if you can't start there, you need to back up till you can. Because the authority of the Word of God is real. And until you buy in that the Word of God will be the authority for your life, you're going to constantly find yourself floundering in your spiritual journey. There's authority from this Word because it comes from God Himself. So Jesus is truth, and then lastly, Jesus is the life. And I'm going to try to wrap this up soon, but there's a lot of Scripture that talks about Jesus and life. And we don't have time to talk about them all, but there's three that I want to point out. John 10.10, 10. I think we have it up here. He says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says, I came so that people would not only have long-lasting, eternal life, but that they would have an abundant life, like quality-wise. Not necessarily in the ways of this world, but living out the purpose and the design that God shaped you for. That's an abundant life. That, that's why we see that the happiest people are not people who always have the most money or have the biggest house or always have this or that. The happiest people consistently be the people who mimic those things that the gospel mimics of volunteering and serving and pouring their hearts out for the needs of others. The happiest people I've ever met in my life seem to be people who you wouldn't think would be real happy if you looked at their circumstances, but when you look at their faith and their confidence in God, there's a whole different level of joy. That's the abundant life. He's like, I'm gonna, I want to give you an abundant life. That's why I came. You can't have that without me. But in Christ, you can. And, and then he goes on. And, he, and, 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 and I, let me look at it here. Where's it at? Uh, yeah, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's that word life again. Are you seeing it? You'll start seeing a pattern if you look at Scripture. And then if you get on down to the bottom of this, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy. By the way, that word way is the word hodos, our road way, uh, term. He says, The road is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way, the hodos, is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Jesus says, There's a way to life, but only a few are going to find it. The vast majority of this world is going to be on a wide path. And the road that's most traveled is unfortunately a road that leads to everlasting destruction. And that should break our hearts. It, it breaks my heart to look in my community and go, you know, I believe God's word is true, which means that most likely the vast majority of people that I talk to today in this community are on their way to destruction. If you're a believer, that should break us. To know that people are going to close their eyes for the last time and wake up in torment. Jesus says, though, it doesn't have to be that way. I'm life. You can have life. 
you don't have to go this way because I am that life. In other words, if you want the life that God is offering, abundant and eternal, quality and quantity, then you have to know that the only way you get there is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the only way. The great theologian I was reading this week when I was preparing this sermon, you cannot sing this song as we, as we read this because it'll tell me too much about you. Um, the great theologian, Kenny Chesney, um, wrote a song. And it's a catchy song, okay? I'm not going to lie. I'm like, duh, duh, duh. I get it. But it's called Everyone Wants to Go to Heaven. You know the song, don't you? You can, you can hear it. Like You're like, yeah, like, I, I usually drink rum with that song. But anyway, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting song. But, but one of the verses he says this, I'm not singing it, okay? Preacher, maybe you didn't see me throw an extra 20 in the plate. There's one for everything I did last night and one to get me through today. Here's a 10 to help you remember next time you got the good Lord's ear. Say I'm coming, but there ain't no hurry. I'm having fun down here. Don't you know that? You know, I believe that the biggest challenge for most of us pursuing the life that God has called us to is because we're substituting a good life in place of the life. I, I think that's probably why in cultures that are not so affluent, and, and if you didn't realize, you might be like, I am, yeah. In cultures that are not so wealthy, in other parts of this world, where, where there's just destitute after destitute, there's just brokenness, there's all this poverty, also comes oftentimes a better listening ear to the gospel. Because you're not balancing out which life you want, because this life's pretty crummy. But here in the U.S. of A., we are blessed, amen? We are. But sometimes I'm afraid that blessing comes at a high cost because we're constantly battling between making this life better and living the life God's called us to. And the blessings of God become the biggest burden to following God. That's just my two cents. I think that's probably true. I know it's true in my life that sometimes the blessings become distractions. That, that sometimes all, the extra money, I mean, how many of us, if we're honest, you know, we get a little extra money? Most of us, I mean, not me, I'm, I'm holy, but no, I'm joking. Most of us, though, right? If I get an extra thousand bucks, I'm not probably thinking about who I'm going to bless. I'm thinking about the blessing that God has poured out on me to use for me, Right? Because I'm, my flesh, even though it's been crucified with Christ, I still have to walk around with this thing, and it really likes everything else. And I like the good, shiny things. And I like the new stuff, and I like the toys, and, and I like all this stuff. And just because I became a Christian doesn't mean I stopped liking stuff, right? But it means that I have something greater to live for. And now that I have Christ, I have a different life possible, and it's an abundant life that when the stock market crashes, and it does, or when the health fails, and it will for all of us, or when the looks fade, and I don't know if I ever had them, but when things break down because this world always is decaying, and all those things that I've been putting my hope in, when they finally fall away, and they always do. What are you left with if you don't have the life that Christ has offered? We're going to have a quick time of invitation, and what we're going to do in this time is I just want to challenge you guys to ask yourself two questions. We kind of started the sermon with them. One, in light of all that we've read today about Jesus and his that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and this fact that no one comes to the Father except through him. Do you feel more confident in your salvation? Or are you kind of like the disciples and kind of troubled? 
Because when you go out in this world, and you, you, if you go out right now and you have a conversation with just random people, and you ask them this question about, hey, why do you have hope? First off, do you have hope that you have eternal life with God? Do you, do you have that? And some people say, I don't know. Well, that, that's fine. I, I appreciate the honesty. But a lot of people say, yeah, I'm confident. Okay. Why? Why are you confident? I'm not trying to be pry too much. Why are you so confident? I'd like to know. Because this is a really important thing to not be confident. And I would say, and this is not scientific, but I would say in my own experience, well over half of the people will come back with one of the other roads we mentioned. Well, because you know what? I'm a pretty decent person. I really don't do a lot of bad. I'm a lot better than some people. And the reality is, is a lot of times that's true. They are better than a lot of people. They don't do a quote, a lot of bad. They're pretty decent people. But if your answer isn't, because at one time in my life, I recognized that I was a sinner. And I recognized that I was hopeless and helpless without a Savior. And I know that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. So that if I accept his gift by faith, confessing my sins, believing in him or trusting in him for eternal life, if your answer is not that, you should not be confident. You should be troubled. And I think we have a room in here with a lot of people. And I'm going to be honest, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to any, quote, experiences you've had. But if you're in this room and you say, Chris, I threw up a prayer one time, but I didn't really understand what I was doing. Then maybe that today is the day to make that right. And to come before the Lord humbly surrendered to Him. God, I need you. I'm broken. I can't do it myself. Maybe you hear, you're hearing you've never even heard this message before and you want to accept Him as your Savior. I don't know where you are, but I know one thing. Every one of us in this room will one day bow to Jesus. Some will bow to Him as His children prior to entering into eternity with the Father, and some will bow right before they are cast into everlasting judgment. But one day, every single knee on this earth will bow before Him. Let it be bowing to a Savior, not to the judge. And you have the decision right now to bow to a Savior. Maybe you're here and you've got more questions and you want to ask them before you make that decision. I will drop anything on my calendar for that conversation. Anything. Please don't let today go by without having that conversation with someone, me, someone on the staff, someone you know that's a follower of Christ. Have the conversation now. We're not guaranteed tomorrow, you know. On this day, a couple of decades ago, there's about 3,000 people who woke up thinking it was any other day. Young people, kids, moms, dads, siblings, older folks who thought this is just another day. And they didn't get tomorrow. And I'm not trying to say that to be a scare tactic. I'm trying to say it to be fair and be a warning. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are. So don't depend on something tomorrow. Accept him today.